it's so interesting when you look at the NHL, and I, we talk about Gary Bettman being the best commissioner in sports. It's not saying much, especially <laughs> what we've seen with Rob Manford and this lockout, which I think is going to hurt baseball. What we've seen Roger Goodell do, yes, these guys are bringing in money for these organizations, and yes, the TV deals are absolutely astronomical, and, and Adam Silver seems like he's LeBron James you-know-what. He might as well be LeBron James's dog, because whatever LeBron James says, it happens to be, and it goes. And by the way, LeBron James, he's done very well. His team has been absolutely hard. Horrible, the Lakers. But you look at the NHL and you look at where it was a couple of weeks ago where the Islanders were so COVID out and the NHL decided not to cancel games. The Islanders lost like nine games, ten games in a row before they finally got a win in overtime or got a tie in overtime with no points. And, and, and with all the injuries and all the situations with COVID, I thought the NHL should have cut the games Earlier in the season, late November, early December, the game should have been cut to the beginning of January. Well, they didn't, and and you see what happened. And then all of a sudden with the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto Maple Leafs, and the Ottawa Senators, when COVID started to spread out over there in Canada, well, you know what they're going to do? They'll cancel the games for two or three weeks. Does it benefit some of these teams that are have a fighting right now injuries? Yes. Did it benefit the Islanders? Absolutely did. But it could be too little too late for the New York Islanders. The Islanders came back the other day. They won a game against the Sabres. I'm not surprised. If we are talking about the Buffalo Sabres. But early in the season, Buffalo was just killing the Islanders. They were not the Islander team that we thought they were going to be. Coming back the other day, we see what Barzell could be, if he could start skating. And this team, winning four. 4-1 against the Sabres. I want to see this team start playing harder. I think Barry Trotz getting his voice out, being that they had this time to sit out and figure out from right and wrong. I think the Islanders are going to be a better team moving forward. As far as the Rangers are concerned, I think this is going to hurt the Rangers. I really do, because the Rangers are playing very good hockey. They have the momentum. Now, does it help them in the goaltending category? Yes, it does, because it gives their goaltender, Sestorkin, a little bit of time to, to get healthy. But the Rangers, in their first game back uh, against Florida, they did not play well. And obviously, last night against the Lightning, it was back and forth, too. So I think this is affected, and it is going to affect the Rangers, because we saw this a couple of years ago. The Islanders weren't playing good hockey, and then the COVID-19 started to spread. Then the bubble started to happen. The Rangers were playing great hockey. They were moving forward. And then all of a sudden they came back. The Rangers played like crap. The Islanders won like nine games in a row or eight games in a row. And there she goes. There she blows. But the Rangers have such a good lead on the Islanders right now and a lot of these teams in the Eastern Conference. Even if they go into this losing streak, the Islanders have to win like five, six games in a row three or four times to catch up to the teams that are in front of them. So the Islanders are going to have to play catch-up, even though it's still early and the Islanders could catch them. And the Rangers, they could play 500 hockey right now and make the playoffs, Speedy. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the splits as well. You mentioned the Canadian teams versus some of the American teams that got hit with it, the Islanders being one of them, the Bruins another one, Nashville another one. There's a couple of those like fringe teams that, again, should be better than they are, and maybe these rules that have happened with them and these not delaying the games more is definitely something that could affect them in comparison and to some of the Canadian teams like Vancouver, who was hit by it. They were on a seven-game winning streak that just ended yesterday against the LA Kings. So it'll be definitely interesting to see how those splits go. The Rangers lost to a, F- a Florida Panthers team that's very good. I'm not going to judge one game as being the sole basis. I've never been a proponent of judging streaks as being a big deal anyway. So the Rangers have to be consistent as a whole and not let it get to them. Florida just also put up nine goals on Tampa Bay, too. So it shows how good of a team they are. We'll see on that. The Islanders definitely coming back nicely against the Sabres. It's one game as well. It's the Sabres. The Sabres were good for a month, and now they've back to closer to the basement where they love to be in the last 15 years. So not surprising there. Can they string some wins together is a good thing for the Islanders. They have a chance still with the Flyers having some COVID issues as well. The Blue Jackets not being a great team. Detroit's in the second wild card spot. I mean, I don't think any of us are expecting that to last. But if the Islanders keep struggling, maybe it will. And then will they be able to leapfrog a team like the Bruins who have had the similar COVID issues and have lost a lot of games because of that? The Bruins have only played 26 games as well. The Islanders have played 27. So that could be an interesting race in terms of the games at hand if they can only afford to do it in the wild card too. And then the Penguins are the first wild card spot who have 39 points, but still are kind of an older team. So definitely still some room for the Islanders if they can get on a nice streak. Absolutely. To me, what the Rangers should be concerned about is really the momentum and what this team is. They they haven't been in this position in a very long time in the last couple of years now with a coach a new coach a rookie coach this year he's not a rookie coach in the NHL but a rookie coach this year you're going to be playing catch up 
And that's, to me, a very important thing for the Rangers, Speedy. I mean, your thoughts with this goaltending situation, they don't really have a backup goaltender moving forward in the rest of the season. So I have to depend on their young, young, talented goaltender. It's just dorky. Yeah. Well, he's going to play the majority anyway. It's not like it's a 1A, 1B type split like a lot of other teams. He's obviously the number one. Georgiev just went on the COVID list. So now Keith Kincaid is back to being the backup, who I personally have always liked more than Georgiev anyway. So, all right. But Shostorkin should be playing most of the games as it is. And I hope he does get that chance to do so. And it'll be interesting to judge the injury recovery versus the rust for the young goalie, too, because it is a very injury-prone position. And when you have these goaltenders that have gotten hurt earlier in their careers, will it help them be able to adjust it for it right away? Will it hurt them where they have it affect their mental state, too? Because it's a position that you're the one guy. You're the last line of defense. It could be very tough on you mentally for a young goalie, especially in a position where the Rangers are in, where they're doing a lot better than people expected. They're right now three points behind the Capitals and the Carolina Hurricanes right now. So they're contending. They're doing well. It's just, yeah, can they adjust to be able to do that? Tough loss against the Panthers. Three goals in the third period. Not good. Not a good start, but hopefully they could bounce back. And Brock Nelson coming back for the Islanders. Pulak coming back sometime early January. I mean, this could be the perfect time for the Islanders to have those winning streaks where the Islanders can win three, four, five games in a row, get back to competitive hockey where they can catch Philadelphia, they can catch Columbus and the teams that are in front of them, and then fight for that last wild card spot or the second to last wild card spot where they could squeak into the playoffs and no team. No team is going to want to play the Islanders in the first round, especially with the young talent that they have that have been into the playoffs the way they have, the way this defense is set up to really dominate in the playoffs. So I'm very interested to see moving forward what the Islanders are and what they could do at the trade deadline with uh, Lula Morello. I think he's going to make the moves that they probably need to become a more offensive, talented team. And I want to see Paul Mary play better. I want to see some of these players start to play better. As far as the MLB is concerned, there's a lot to say with Buck when he was introduced the last couple of weeks really a week and a half. He's done his little, I guess, back and forth with ESPN and WFAN and CBS here in New York. He's been on all the radio shows, but hours. I, I would love to get Buck on our show to talk a little Mets baseball. But, you know, it's so interesting about Buck because I think Buck is one of the more respectable managers in baseball. He really is. And a lot of people were pushing for Buck to get this job with the Mets. You talk about the GM position. We didn't know where the Mets were going. They interviewed like 25 people before they landed Epler. But I think Buck was the best predominant manager that was available this offseason. And landing Buck, it really solidifies where the Mets are and what the Mets could be this year if they can get it all together. Now, adding a guy like Max Scherzer, if he could stay healthy with his shoulder problem at the end of the dead arm or whatever they say he had, he's got to stay healthy this year because their third and fourth guy, I'm not too excited about, especially what they did in the second half of the season with Walker. I expect this team to be a better offensive team. They added Marte, who could steal bases. He had 57 stolen bases last year. One of the faster guys on the bases, which the Mets have not had since Carlos Beltran. Nearly led both leagues and stolen bases. <laughs> yes, I think it's going to change the offense. It's going to give them more opportunities to get RBIs and may, might help Lindor out, might help guys like Pete Alonso out as far as offensive is concerned. Do they move him as their number one from Nimmo, who uh, has been the number one hitter really for the last couple of years? I think Marte would be a very big positional player as far as defensively is concerned at center field, but do you move Nimmo to bat second and move Marte as your number one guy because he's going to get on base, he's going to steal bases, he's going to give you better opportunities to get you more runs. So it's going to be very interesting how Buck is going to situate this team in this lineup. But I, I really like Buck Showalter. I really like what he had to say. And if you're a Mets fan, you should be very excited for all the moves that they made this offseason. But really, Buck Showalter is the lead guy moving forward in their dugout. I don't think there's one obvious leadoff spot to answer that question because remember, with the athletics too, Mark Hanna also hit leadoff when he was there too. That was even with Marte there. So both those guys know how to get on base and have good speed. Obviously, Marte's the better raw stolen base guy. But it'll be interesting because they've had, the Mets have had different rotations of leadoff hitters as well. They had McNeil at some point. They had Nimmo. And when McNeil was hurt, then they reversed it back. They've had different options. And I think Buck's going to change that way too. And it also depends on playing time as well. Because Marte and Kana should be starting consistently. But a guy like McNeil, a guy like Nimmo... Even Dominic Smith throwing in there, not that he'd lead off, but a guy that they could throw in there, J.D. Davis, if he's still there, too. I would imagine one of them's going to be traded, but if they're all still there, they're going to platoon in some facet because none of them have really earned the job of obvious 
shoe in starters. And now getting Connor, getting Marte, and Eduardo Escobar, too, in that mix definitely could change that kind of platoon for him. And it'll be interesting with Buck Showalter, too, because he's used to these teams that have more of these obvious traditional lineups, too, where the Orioles, they had their set guys, with their outfielders, with Machado, with J.J. Hardy when he was there, Chris Davis, Matt Wieters, the Rangers, Nelson Cruz, Josh Hamilton, Elvis Anders, Michael Young. They had those set guys where they didn't really have a lot of extra platooning to do, but Buck still kind of made that kind of thing work. Now with the Mets, they have kind of that similar where... These guys are all good at certain spurts, but not great at one thing. So will he be able to adjust to that kind of things with the analytics, too? Because he's more of an old-school manager. Whereas the analytics department that the Mets have, we'll see if it could help him out, too, maybe to evolve his game, too, because the Orioles really didn't help him out with that.